This was a little building that we made a temporary historic miniature golf course. There's a kind of conceptual craft underpinning to all of our Wow House projects. This was a project that was a solar powered micro radio studio. I'm trying to articulate through this deep craft the process of making things as I'm making them and then finding the things that really resonate and distilling them into this, this manifesto. That whole deep craft concept was a way for me to kind of rebrand the word craft. I got an old ghost. We got a good life. You know, I was starting to see things like Etsy come out and, and craft was becoming ubiquitous. And at the same time it was being devalued. So I, I like the idea of, a, of deep craft, kind of like borrowed from deep ecology. To me it has to do with with an ethos and almost like, I look at things like vernacular architecture and vernacular design and try to remove them from a particular form and just distill them into working principles. A main one for me is maintenance equals improvement. When something's maintained, it's improved. That's a really simple concept, but it, it's not always true. It's certainly not true about IKEA. So I don't think you could look at a product that's coming out of IKEA as, and call it a deep craft product. This was a chair I developed about 18 years ago, just around the idea of a wooden cantilever with traditional joinery. When you love something, when there's a kind of element of love or some other less tangible aspect to something that's as much a part of its functionality as comfort or durability, then it's a deep craft thing. This one I called crotch rocket. This is still an idea I'd like to develop, but we get to live with the prototypes and find ways of improving them over time by actually using them. Even entropy kind of works into your... Yeah, the way that something decays, you know, or another element of a deep craft thing for me is that the thing that you make should mimic the material life cycle of the plant or the thing that it came from. Mm -hmm. And that's true in cathedrals or in shipbuilding. When you harvest the white pines for the masts, you plant new ones and the masts will last 150 years and then you harvest the new ones. And I think it's about closing loops or making loops beneficial including waste. This pecan wood, for example, it's, it's a waste product from the large table that I'm doing in Healdsburg, but it has an end use. You can smoke fish with green pecan wood. It's not just a waste product that goes away. There is no away. So like, this shop doesn't produce any waste. We have this model where everything is either composted or burned for heat, used for cooking in some cases. This is what I do in small production runs, and it's a really simple stacking chair. I like the idea of a kind of highly crafted, handmade chair, but that still functions like it's a stacking. You can stack it, and it ships well. The deep crafting is a distillation of this broad-ranging body of work that we've developed, and at the same time trying to distill it into something really simple. Maybe there's even one product, that, like a chair. Maybe there's a chair. I use a chair as kind of a metaphor because I think sometimes an entire design movement can be distilled into a chair. The Marcel Brewer chair or the Windsor chair coming out of traditional guilds in England. For me now, it's a skateboard. So this skateboard concept, I really am interested in Windsor chairs and in traditional bodgery. And a lot of my woodworking kind of uses those sorts of tools. They use a lot of traditional hand tools. So I made an experiment that took the idea of a Windsor chair. Do you know what a Windsor chair is? The Windsor chairs are the ones with solid wood seats that are carved and then they have these, they come out of like a wagon maker's guild. So it's like almost like a hub thing with spokes coming out of it. The material that's traditionally used for Windsor chairs is elm and that's still in abundance here because it was a street tree that is still just dying from Dutch elms disease. So I started using elm to make really thin compound laminations and my daughter who was then about 14 was interested in skateboarding. So I thought, what a great way to test the durability of bent lamination in elm than to make it into a skateboard. Yeah, these were the skateboards. Um, it's, a, it's a kind of old school longboard, but I don't know if you can see, I get these really nice contours in them. Um, it's got a, a convex top with raised rails, so you can uh, carve more efficiently without falling off. And it's also got a camber 
lengthwise so that you get a little bit of bounce as you're under speed. It's flexible. And they're really fun. They're really fast. You can ride them different ways. I think of them as cruisers, as very urban skateboards. I added a, a kick-up fin on the back so that you could pick it up easily when you're in town or stopping at the cafe. You don't have to lean down. And they're Elm. And they have my trademarked deep logo, which is becoming my brand. I stamp in the um, Latin name of the wood. So this is Almus Americana. And this was the first one. So I think of them as a series. You know, it's an ongoing series. There'll only be a certain amount in Elm. And I like the idea of something that's really contemporary that hits skate culture and surf culture instead of high design or architecture or even contemporary art. It kind of transcends it or it skips it, you know? But it's okay to be practical. Totally. Yeah. yeah. It's better and affordable. Yeah. I mean, the price points are still, I find that people will spend more for a really carefully handmade thing by hand. There's a value to that, but there's a limit to that value too, you know? These are a great calling card because they're very friendly, they're very approachable. You know, you can't argue with something like a friendly skateboard that's fun, it's just about fun and it's playful, that still manages to capture all of the kind of deep thinking behind it, you know. I'd like to develop this into a very, well, not too slow, but a slow, slowly built product line. When Anna and I were first starting to um, get known for Wow House projects we were doing, we tried to take these things that we did that were kind of an extension of our lives and extensions of conversations and just hanging out and help people understand what they were. So we came up with this idea of what makes a good date. It's basically like, how do we design a good day for ourselves, you know, in the course of our day-to-day -day work? And then also, like, how does the project support that so that it can be one of those things that makes your day. I can't remember what I dreamed, what I did, or what I said. Are you deciding what makes a good day? <laughs> it's kind of up for everybody to decide that, but um, I don't think people usually think that way. So we came up with this thing about structured improvisations, and when you can we started to do these things we call now days, where we just drop all obligations and try to disappear into the day and just make decisions very intuitively, but together with n not much thought about outcomes. It just kind of wanders, wanders and ponders. For others, it might be to prepare things and gather things, cook or pickle or meditate or find very structured ways of doing things. For me, what makes a good day in the course of making, because we're often just busy, you have tasks and you have to do these tasks, is when, when I can design something where I enjoy every task, you know, and I'm also learning from it, and then maybe I'm even learning beyond that. I'm learning something about how the world works, or the relationship between nature and culture, or between the East Coast and the West Coast, or Europe and America, you know. I think you can tap all of those things by focusing on really simple mundane tasks. Oh look, there's a little butterfly that just landed on it. But that was another one of the deep craft tenets is prepare for unintended consequences. But that's the, like that. <laughs> yeah. This is another project remnant. This was a bike that I modified and made a trailer and panniers for to build a biodiesel still. We turned a gallery at a university into a biodiesel factory to power the school's tractors for their agricultural program. It's a Dehan folding bike, but I did things like make a custom kind of pannier for the box, and I modified some bike parts to make a trailer. And it's designed around the proportions of those gas cans. So you can carry 15 gallons of fryer fat in one trip. The idea was you go around the campus and collect used fryer fat and ride it back to the gallery, filter it, and convert the fryer fat into biodiesel. One of the points I love too is the whole, how do you put it, not extreme frugality. But a, a kind of a exuberant frugality or something like that, where you can make something really beautiful with 
very little, very few means. I mean, I think that's a lesson from poverty too, you know. The best cooking, I think, comes from a kind of poverty paradigm where you, you can be exuberant with one egg, you know, half an onion, a handful of herbs, and make something really soulful, you know.